just I, yeah, take it away. Thank you. I just want to say thank you so much, Parat Library and, and Julie and Rich Gunnett for having me. This is lovely. Yeah, I, I certainly echo that. Um, I just before we get started, I, I have a one favorite leftover food story. Uh, back in the probably the 1980s, before Ruth Reichel became the food editor of the Los Angeles Times, uh, I grew up in LA. I was there for most of my life, uh, and I read the food section uh, religiously every every Thursday. Uh, and they had a, one of those question and answer period uh, sections where readers would write in and say, you know, what what does this recipe actually call for? And if I can't use this, what can I use? Uh, somebody wrote in. People tend not to believe me when I say this, but somebody wrote in and said. Your recipe for chicken tacos called for the use of leftover chicken. Can you tell me where I can get <laughs> leftover chicken? <laughs> and, and they gave her a straight answer. I don't remember what it was, but uh, anyway. Uh, just, uh, I mean, you, you all, I, I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that um, food waste is a tremendous problem in this country and in the world. Um, I, I read uh, a UN report for 2020 or 2021 that estimated that we waste three trillion pounds of food a year in America, including half of all the fruits and vegetables that are grown here, get thrown away, not eaten, not fed to, to animals, but just uh, they end up in landfills. Uh, maybe if we're lucky, some of it in compost uh, piles, but I don't, I don't know how much. Uh, and it's a tremendous problem worldwide. Uh, ironically, some of the poorest countries in the world have huge amounts of food waste. Uh, even though they're starving because they don't have means of distribution and preservation, refrigeration and so forth. Uh, in this country, our food waste is, that's not the problem. Our problem is it's more cultural. It's that, you know, we, we see a spot on an apple and we think it's no good. Uh, uh, the, uh, the meat uh, doesn't look, uh, well, actually meat's a bad example. <laughs> um, but you, you, you see something that doesn't look quite right or it's been in the refrigerator too long or you're just not in the mood for it or you you overpeel something. I see a lot of people, uh, when they peel a vegetable or something, and almost half the volume of the vegetable is, is thrown in the garbage disposal. Uh, so that's a, that's a big problem here. And uh, I, I think what I really loved about this book, what I, when I saw it, is it's, it's not preachy at all. It's not, uh, it's not a political tract. Uh, it's really practical, with full of all of these great uh, recipes, and besides recipes, just general ideas of, of how to use virtually every part of every piece of food you buy, with, with very few exceptions. Uh, I, just to get into this, uh, one, one of the worst questions that people can ask an author is, where do you get your ideas? <laughs> so I'm going to ask Tamara where she got her ideas to write this book. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I, I got my ideas for the recipes in this book, mostly from eating and traveling and reading books from other places. I feel, I, I feel like I wrote this once, but I couldn't write enough times that I don't feel like I invented anything, but I also don't feel like anybody invents anything culinarily. I think everything is derivative in a really good way, in a positive way. We're all taking tastes that we tasted once, or some, you know, even if you're following a recipe, the person who wrote it tasted something once that they're trying to transcribe. Um, and, you know, when you said, when you talked about a sort of cultural, a, a cultural issue, <coughs> tons of culinary cultures in the world cook more of what they have than we do. And it's not hard to find recipes in Chinese cuisine, in Thai cuisine, in traditional Southern black cuisine, in, uh, in all of South Asia and so much of Europe where the recipe itself is based on something that we often, we, we being like, you know, Americans right now would consider not usable because it has a date on it or because it has a blemish, as you said. Um, but like, I have so many stale bread recipes in this book and I didn't put all of the things that I do with stale bread in there. And the same with beans, like there's like a limit to the number of pages you can use for a certain thing. But all of that comes from what people all over the world do. And they're not, I think an important thing is that in those cultures and cuisines, those ingredients aren't considered leftovers. They're considered ingredients that have evolved, 
right? So like red is one thing when it's fresh. It's another thing the next day. It's another thing three days after that. And it's just a different ingredient. So I think um, my, my lucky access to lots of different cultures foods was sort of where I got my ideas about what to do with stuff. So not, not so much even the specifics, but the idea of what attracted you to the idea of using every bit of, of food, uh, the, the whole concept of the book, uh, using, you say, leftovers. And I think most of us, you say leftovers, you think of that stuff in the Tupperware at the back of the refrigerator, but which is, which is part of it. But, uh, you know, the peels and the, the seeds and the, everything else. What inspired you to, take, to, to look at that group of recipes and that kind of food? I think so much delicious food is actually just made of, of things that we don't normally, we in America right now don't always think of. I mean, like, when I, when I make the most delicious pot of beans I could ever make, I cannot make it without the tops of fennel and, um, like, the stems of parsley. There's no, and you're not going to put whole pieces of fennel in there. Don't do that. Um, because you don't need to. You can use that for a salad or to roast or whatever. So part of it was out of just, you know, um, like hedonic uh, desire. And then and then part of it is it's a kind of, I have an innate frugality that I also, you know, like that, that, find, that, uh, that feels creative to me always. Like I love mending things. I love mending clothing. I love stuff with holes in it because I can fix the hole. You know, it's like a, it's an aesthetic and like a, yeah, it's, a, it's like a, I feel like it's something that's innate to me where I'm like, or, and I also like an underdog. Whatever is, whatever is like peeled off or has a hole in it, I like, and I want to make that like special. And so I think a combination of hedonism and okay. an aesthetic love of the underdog probably. Yeah, I've read somewhere years ago, somebody said uh, every good chef is a recycler. Definitely. And part of that has to do with the fact that the word chef doesn't mean cook or even very good cook. It means boss. And a chef, in the traditional sense, uh, is the boss of a kitchen. And certainly it involves culinary imagination and, and actual cooking in, in many cases. But it also involves running the kitchen, which involves economically running the kitchen. And so chefs don't, they hate to throw things away because, you know, I, I remember Jacques Pepin, when he, he came to Sever one time, he told us when he was a boy, in a, uh, some French restaurant where he was a, a young stagiaire uh, just learning the tricks. When you took a dozen eggs and you broke the eggs and you put them in a bowl, then he took his finger and go like that with every eggshell and he got another egg out. Um, so, here, here. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a great restaurant in Los Angeles years ago called Scandia and they had a really bargain price uh, lunch menu, blackboard lunch menu, it changed every day, and uh, it was like six seventy-five for two courses. And of course, that's this was many years ago. But um, and it, you looked at this menu and you saw, oh, the salad was made with spinach roots, or spinach stalks, not with the leaves, but the stalks that are ordinarily people would throw away. Uh, they always had fricadella or some kind of meatball, uh, which you knew was the the veal loin from last night that they didn't sell. And the whole the whole menu was based on on things like that, and which is why they could offer it so cheaply. And I, I think there you see a lot of that really, or we don't see it, we don't necessarily notice it, but a lot of that goes on. I think. Well, and knowing that that's like that that's exciting and good, right? That's not gross. That's not. I feel like you're sometimes. I loved Anthony Bourdain's first New Yorker piece in the in the book that turns into, yeah. but I think it also kind of did a. a really good literary job of like getting in people's heads that things that are left over in restaurants are like gross and bad as opposed to another truth which is that restaurants are always doing a great job of using all of everything and it's wonderful if you can take last night's you know filet and turn it into today's meatball and charge a little bit less for it and that's also how so many of the great foods of the world are made uh, yeah, you uh, you mentioned bread before. I wanted to talk a little bit about bread. I I, I was just telling Tamara that uh, I don't know if it's still there, but some years ago I was uh, at flew into Oakland and driving uh, toward Berkeley from Oakland. There there was there is or was a big commercial bakery off to the side, and they had a huge picture of one of their packaged loaves of bread, and their slogan was something like 
it never goes stale. I said, oh, boy, that's a problem. <laughs> I wouldn't be bragging about that if I were you. Um, but as, as you were saying, bread evolves, and, and you use it for different things at different stages. And other than the, the things that we know about, uh, uh, Ribolita and Pantanella and things like that, uh, what else would you use if you had old, dry, non-moldy bread? And I actually want to ask you how you feel about mold on bread, by the way, too. But if you had you know, a piece of a slice of sourdough that was as hard as a, as a cracker, what would you do with it? That, that particular piece of bread, I've grinded the breadcrumbs. But um, you can also, there's no bread so hard, it's not moldy, that you can't actually soak into softness. So you could totally put that in. It doesn't even have to be a ribolita. Like you can put a piece of bread that's like, you know, shatteringly hard into another soup you're making. And it doesn't have to be a particular soup. It could be any soup. And let it hang out there for half an hour, forty-five minutes, and it will just become—it will just be like a creamifier. I mean, it's starch, you know. Like, think about what happens if you put um, like cornstarch into something, and it thickens up and becomes creamy. Or potatoes, which thicken things up, especially potatoes. Like three days later, they've become this like wonderful creamy thing. Um, so I, I certainly always use it like that. Um, and I also think with bread, knowing the stuff you can do is important for how you store it, like how you first approach it. You know, like if you, if you, it's like if you just leave it to go stale, it's less approachable than if you're, I find, than if you're like, I know that I'm going to only eat about half of you, so I'm going to slice your other half, or, you know, cube your other half and freeze you, or cube your other half and let you dry, and sort of like have some understanding that you're going to, you're going to use the rest of it and do a storage solution, like which would just be slicing and freezing or cubing and freezing. Um, that that helps you with that. But basically, as long as it's not molded bread, there's no like there's no there's no endpoint as long as it's not moldy. Do you, do you ever cut the mold off bread and eat the rest of it? I don't think so because I when I think of bread that's molded, it tends to be like. I've never had a like a sourdough loaf or something that's gotten mold on it. I feel like the ones that have gotten mold are like sliced bread. I don't know. I don't. What? How about you? No, I mean I, I've I've had it with different kinds of bread, uh, including some art, artisanal bread I buy at the farmers markets and things. But um, I, if it's you know if it's throughout or something, I'm not going to try to pull every little vein out. But if it's usually you get a little bit on the crust. Oh and, yeah. And, and sometimes you have to look and say, wait a minute, is that flour? Or is that mold? You know? Oh, I definitely because just think it's flour. Yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah. I'm just like, no, you're just flour. Yeah, right. yeah. Sure but I'll, but I'll, I'll cut that off. Yeah. I mean, some people say you shouldn't. If there's any mold, you shouldn't eat bread. So I don't want to encourage you to eat it. Uh, but that's what I would do. I want to encourage you to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, so um, leftovers is in the title of your book. And as I said, a lot of people, when they think about leftovers, think about something that's already cooked, and it sits in the refrigerator and it's uh, over there. And it, I don't know if any of you who have to do that, do you actually label your uh, containers so you know how long it's been in there? You're, some people say you're supposed to. I've never done that. I don't know if you do that. You put a date on it? Yeah, put a date on it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, no I, I don't need, I remember when yeah. I put things yeah, in. Yeah, um, so I don't need to. But it would help. I mean, sometimes, every now and again, I do. It helps my husband. <laughs> um, Poor husbands. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you a story about that. When uh, in, in one of Ruth Rochel's books, she describes her mother, who I gather was not a terribly good cook, but there was something in a Tupperware container in the refrigerator, and she pulled it out, opened it up, looked at it, and said to her husband, took a spoon and said, here, taste this. And he, and he said, oh, God, and he spit it out in the sink. And she said, hmm, just as I thought, spoiled. <laughs> Well, I think that people keep on, not keep on, I, a question I have heard repeatedly since the publication of this book from audience members is, what is the number of days that something should be in the fridge? And what is the number of weeks or months that something should be in the freezer? And I keep on, I hope gently, um, deferring that question because I think that having a set number um, short circuits your ability to use your senses 
to make decisions. So I'm sorry that Ruth's mom had her husband do it, but I do encourage everybody to use your census instead of having a three-day rule. Like I know the three-day rule or the six-month rule or whatever, <coughs> but the issue with those rules is that they're, they're not made for what's in your fridge. They're not universally applicable. They're, they're, they're ideas, they're an average. And so if you yourself can observe that when meat, for example, gets frostbitten, when, and when there's actually you've frozen meat, and there's like all of these little icicles and frost on the plastic, it's not gonna taste good. It, that, too much of that's all the moisture that was in the meat. You can do the best job cooking it, it will still, the texture and the taste will be messed up and it will not be good. But you need to see that because there's a chance that at like that the New York Times will have told you to throw that thing out at six months. But if you take it out at six months, it's not frostbitten and it looks great. And that's actually the only thing that you would worry about with frozen meat. So I, I and like with other things, you know, people are like, but it's you know, my clams gone bad. They've been in my fridge for three days, and you know, the Wall Street Journal for three days. And the um, fact is that clams smell terrible. So you should smell them, and uh, I just want to bring this up because I know it's a it's a it's a burning question in everybody. Like, but what is the number? And the number is your census. Sure. There's not a number because yeah. nobody else has been in your house and seen your things. And we've got incredibly friendly, trained census. You can smell and taste and touch and see, and we can figure it out better than somebody who's never seen your food. Yeah, I, I think uh, the sense of smell is very important. Uh, obviously, some people. Uh, don't have a very good sense of smell. Uh, the great, uh, one of my uh, favorite, most uh, frequent collaborators and colleagues, Christopher Hersheimer, uh, who's a female Christopher, wonderful photographer, wonderful cook, um, who's one of the co-founders of Sever. Her husband has no sense of taste, and that's not a reference to his marrying her. It's uh, <laughs> I mean, he, he literally can't taste her food, and he uh, he can get the very basics, the salt and the acidity, and that's about it, which is terrible. And I know some people were affected by COVID that way, uh, which is terrible. But for most of us, we do have a sense of smell. Um, I remember uh, our chef friend Jonathan Waxman telling me one time about meat, that if you uh, take a piece of meat, whether it's raw or whether it's been served to you in a restaurant cooked, and it smells funny, don't eat it. Don't take a chance. Don't say, oh, it doesn't smell that bad. It's not worth the chance. Uh, but uh, sometimes you, you also have to know some, some meats do smell stronger. Uh, if you have a, a venison or if you have uh, some lamb or duck or something, it'll have a stronger smell than a supermarket steak will. Uh, so that doesn't mean it's bad. That, that just means and it's also an important correlate being if it doesn't smell bad, right? Like that there's a, I, I write about this a couple of times in this book and I've also written a little bit about it since because <laughs> I read a study after I turned in the book that I thought was incredible. But the study was, in, I forget what journal, but a medical journal. That's not a good source, but I, okay, I put the source in the um, Washington Post, so it's in there. And it was a study that found that the, um, the feeling of disgust, or the affect of disgust, was actually evolutionarily, um, we, it was finally tested, it, it is evolutionarily tuned to keep us out of danger. So. I forget how the study was done, but I did link to it in this article. Um, but you can, like, the reason we have that response to things is because it, it, it is alerting us to something real. This might be dangerous. And like, that's disgust. Disgust is a strong word and a strong affective emotion. And when you think about the difference between that and being like, is this good or not? When you feel disgusted, you know it is not good. Your whole being is like, no way. And that's how you know something is bad. Yeah. So this, this kind of is, in a sense, the same thing that you were talking about. Uh, but talk a little bit about those sell-by dates or best-by dates that you see on almost any packaged food. <laughs> Julie in the front row was like, preach. <laughs> I can see you. I can see you. Yeah. Um, and I feel like this is getting more attention now and is becoming more widely understood. So I understand that I'm not the first person to say this to the people in this room. But um, sell-by dates and best-by dates uh, have no correlation 
zero correlation with safety. They were never, they're not made based on any safety requirements or health requirements. They're, they were they were never <coughs> intended to be. They were designed in the 1970s to help um, with two things. One is supermarket shelf rotation. So like to help, you know, when people are stocking, you do need to know what came in before and what came in after. And then also on a like purely competitive basis, companies were worried that uh, like if their like if their yogurt had been on the shelf for a week, it would be fine on the shelf for six months, but it might taste different than another company's yogurt that had just gotten there. So they would want a date that made it clear that it it couldn't be compared exactly to the other company's yogurt. But they don't they they're not they're they're not federally mandated or federally regulated. So there's a and it's there there was a bill during I don't have the bill first, but they're they're not federally regulated, and um, it's not that they have no information. They just don't have they don't contain the information that any of us need to decide whether or not to save our food, or you know, and use our food and cook our food, or just waste our food. So they're not to be used for that. You should have to use other things for that. Like the aforementioned sense of smell and sense disgust. of disgust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course, some people are disgusted by perfectly good French fresh. Um, sweetbreads or calves brains or other strong flavored things, but that just means you don't have to eat it. You shouldn't eat it. You know that there there is a an idea in some people's mind that a quote unquote a gourmet a true gourmet eats everything. But no, a true gourmet knows what he or she likes and doesn't like, and that's what they eat. That's it's very. I, I would I made an argument once. I didn't get very far with it, but I was trying to argue that. That somebody that said, you know, I like the fries at McDonald's, but I don't like the burger. I like the burger at Wendy's, and I like the so they'd make a trip around and buy one thing at each place. That that was a gourmet. Now I, I didn't sell that idea, but uh, that, that was that. But I, I really do believe that. I don't think a gourmet has to, or a, a serious food person has to like everything or have to eat everything. And I don't see the point in eating anything you don't like. I mean, why? You know, it's, uh, unless you're starving and it's the only thing there. Um, so, one thing I have to admit was new to me in the book completely. I mean, there's a lot of new things to me, but an idea, a whole chapter that was new to me and makes perfect sense is containers. And I, I think of, you know, if you recycle and you're a, a nice recycler, you rinse everything out, you get the little, the rest of the peanut butter, you get the rest of the salsa, you get the rest of everything out of that container before you put it in the recycling bin. Okay. But, no need to do that. <laughs> until you've gotten everything you can out of it. Right? I was thinking about this today because I was, this morning for breakfast, I had yogurt and granola, as I sometimes do, and I got like most of the yogurt out. You could never get all of the yogurt out. And I was like, how can I, how, when I'm talking to people, how do I talk about this thing that I do, which is like, there's probably a total of like a tablespoon of yogurt in the container. And it was just thinking that that made me realize that it's also that I often don't have a tablespoon of yogurt or, or cream or sour cream. I realize that the reason that I started using what's left in a container, like to add more ingredients to and shake up and make a sauce out of, is because I, I mean, I don't think anybody ever has everything they need, right? Like there's always, you're like, ah, oh, if only I had a little bit of fish sauce, or like, oh, I can't believe I ran out of ketchup, or like, I just need, you know, when there's like a recipe that's like, Two tablespoons heavy cream. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> no. And that is why I do this thing where I'll keep containers that have like about one or two tablespoons of anything left in them. Because that's often the amount that you need that you don't have. And especially with everything in that chapter, this is the last chapter of the book, and it's called Empty Containers because they're never empty. But like, I never have two tablespoons. But I almost always have like an empty container of Greek yogurt and like an empty container of sour cream. Together, those totally make two tablespoons of cream. That's it. Like says cream on them. You know, it's like that's the. Um, and then same with you know peanut butter. It's like any sauce. It's like you know tamari. Like, I don't have or, or, or um, tahini or whatever. Whatever. It is. I'm like I don't have that. But I do have an empty jar of peanut butter. And I think the reason I started thinking of what was left in there 
um, as a thing was because I never had this like tiny amount that that was like if only I had this and then I realized that I did have it and that's what I really wanted to encourage in that chapter is like you do like you do have it there's it's like empty oh empty mayonnaise is great because you can't get that all out ever but it's mayonnaise is oil and eggs and salt like you any any vinaigrette that you make is better in there just like make the whole recipe but just do it in the mayonnaise container and shake it up and then it has all this richness and viscosity same with yogurt it's like so I just I like always make whatever it is I'm gonna make in the not empty empty container because then you get the tablespoon that you don't have. Yeah, it's 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 exactly like Jacques Pepin with the uh, with the egg. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. But you could probably do that with the yogurt. Just put your finger in there. And yeah. I've done it. Yeah. And you still, you still, you still, it still works better yeah. if you make no, the I, thing I, in there and shake it. What What are some traditional dishes from in, in anywhere in the world? Because you, you certainly covered. Uh, continent and many, many kinds of cooking. Um, what's an example or two of something that you think is a particularly ingenious use of something we would throw away? Um, and it, okay, this is the Catalonian example because I'm sitting next to you. Um, Coleman is a, is a very knowledgeable and expert person on Catalan cuisine. But I, I was thinking today I was going to be talking to you about this wonderful sardinada that I had at a friend's house in Barcelona. Sardinada is when you, they bring all the, you, you eat all the fresh sardines. And, sorry, that was a bad, it's like, it's a, where you, it's, it's a party about sardines where you eat sardines on bread and tomato, like a pan con tomate. And what I was thinking about, about that meal that's so cool is that, so the bread ideally is a, a day or two old for this like whole special meal. Because if it's fresh bread, it will sag under a whole sardine. So the bread has to be a little old. Like, so for this exciting sardine meal that <coughs> celebrates the, the exact amazing harvest of the first sardines, you need old bread. And then you also need old tomatoes, which I love. And so when people threw us, my husband and I, this party in Barcelona, it was a friend whose father is a fisherman, and he brought her his sardines. And they were like, I've never seen sardines like them in my life. They were so, they were just gorgeous. And then the other ingredients were like three day old bread and tomatoes that were like, had those little, like, you know, bruised and moldy spots on them because we needed those two things. And then we ate the best sardines anybody could ever imagine. But on stale bread, rubbed with garlic, rubbed with rotten tomato, which you need so you can like easily <laughs> smash it on there, right. and lots of olive oil, and then you put a whole sardine on it, and you eat all the way to the head. <laughs> a, a, a corollary of that also from Catalonia is, this is not traditional as far as I know, but um, a very good restaurant in Figuera, it's up near the French Quarter, uh, with the curious name of El Motel, and there's a story behind that which I won't go into. You sent me there and I went there. Oh, you did, okay. Yeah. So what they do is, well, in the area, they fish very good sardine, or very good anchovies. And the way they pack them is not in oil, but they pack them whole. They cut off the head, but they pack them whole in coarse salt in barrels. And then when they're going to use them, they take them out, they rinse off the salt, brush it off sometimes, and then pull the uh, anchovy apart, and they have two anchovy fillets. Then they'll drizzle olive oil on it. Well, when you do that, what do you have left over? You have the spine left over. So this one restaurant takes the spines, soaks them in milk for half an hour, rolls them in flour, and deep fries them. And it's the most delicious thing you can imagine. Uh, it's similar to, if you think about it, in sushi bars a lot of times, if you order ebi, a sweet shrimp, they'll give you the head deep fried so you can eat the whole thing on the side if you're, uh, if you're not afraid of it, and it, which is delicious. But um, that's an example of something, uh, whoever thought you'd, you'd eat uh, anchovy bones, but they're, they're made into something really delicious. Um, and I just, to, to one other thing I wanted to mention, because I, I mentioned it to Tamar uh, earlier, uh, an example of something else in another part of the Mediterranean. I did a book on um, Liguria and the, and the county of Nice, the, the more or less the part of the French of the Italian Riviera, 
and in the back country you think of you know the gorgeous fish and everything in the on the coast and all the resorts and everything but the back country is is just crushingly poor uh, certainly was uh, a little less so now but really poor and people in some of those little valleys um, they would subsist on menus of nothing but chestnuts and persimmons, which grew on the, on the trees, and they had very little to eat. When they cooked pasta, and it was kind of a special occasion, because pasta, they, they don't have enough wheat to make their own, so you know, they had to buy it. But they cooked their pasta, they saved the pasta water, and what they do with the pasta water, I know you have some uses for the pasta water, they saved it to drink because it had starch in it, so it was another, almost another meal. And, and that's, but luckily we don't have to. But, but there are other uses for pasta water. There are, and I should <coughs> probably say them, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to mention, when you told me that story before, what I mentioned, which is Ligurian polpettone. Uh, polpettone means big meatball. But in Liguria, the same region, uh, polpettone is a bread, a leftover, it's all leftovers. And um, it's mashed, leftover mashed potatoes, cooked beans, or maybe like, cooked string beans maybe, uh, breadcrumbs, marjoram, garlic, and olive oil. And it's combined and cooked on a big like paella pan looking thing. And then cooked over a wood fire. And when you get it in a, in a what do you, what's it called, Civitelli? The, the, whatever, the places where you get it yep. in yeah. Genoa, wherever. Um, it's like this beautiful thing that you get in a wedge and it's you know golden and sizzly and it is literally made of leftover mashed potatoes and breadcrumbs. I have a recipe in the book from my friends who've lived in Liguria, but it's so crazy delicious, and it is all made of stuff that we eat quite often. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the, um, well, and also uh, just regular meatballs uh, in, in much of the Mediterranean. Again, you'd use the breadcrumbs, and you'd use whatever meat you had. Um, the traditional Ligurian ravioli, and some people say ravioli was, was from that region originally, uh, the filling of it, the meat filling, had um, not only it had some, maybe some actual veal, but it had um, spinal marrow, cow's udder, and all of these things ground up into a paste, and, and some liver and something. Uh, again, using everything, and the, the idea that uh, for, for most of us, in fact, I mean, now there's, a, there's been a trend in the last 20 years or so, so-called nose-to-tail eating, which is great. Uh, you, you don't throw away uh, anything that you don't have to throw away. Um, there's a, a saying in, uh, I'm sure, in many parts of the world that, that, uh, that eat uh, pork, but uh, a saying that in Catalonia that they use every part of the pig except the squeal. <laughs> and but somebody said that, and someone else said, well, if it's a male uh, animal, you don't use the penis. And someone else said, my grandfather used the fat from the penis to oil his saddle. <laughs> anyway. That was an appropriate pause. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want to throw the floor open to some questions? Yeah, or we could do the leftovers game. <laughs> yeah, but uh, okay, the leftovers game. All right. Then we could do questions after. Okay. The leftovers yeah, leftovers game, game first. All right. Okay. Um, I'll I'll explain the rules of the leftovers game. Everybody takes like twenty seconds, and you think of something. It doesn't have to be a leftover, but something that's in your house or has been in your house that you don't know or haven't known what to do with. And then should we call food. everybody? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. What is this tool for? I have a single blue Lego. <laughs> so do I. I'm sorry. That's just going to be there. Um, yeah, a food item that's in your house that you don't know what to do with. And um, Holman and I will come up with ideas. Um, let's raise hands so that uh, it's all orderly. But also, I would like to invite other people who are here, if you have an idea for the thing that is not presented by one of us, to go ahead and present it so that we're just sharing our knowledge. I, I think the room is small enough so you won't need a mic, uh, I hope. Yeah, no, uh, I think it would be helpful. But, so, yeah, speak, okay, your time loudly. to think has begun now, and we'll tell you when it's over.
Thank you, friend. Okay, that was the signal that's over. <laughs> Who has an idea? A question? Yes. I'm going to say that what I have left is yeah. a cup of cold tea. Shall I take it? Or would yeah, you, you take it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so many things. The most advanced and like complicated is I started using leftover uh, brewed tea to make marble tea eggs, which sounds really hard, but you just take your leftover tea, you add soy sauce, mirror and a little sugar, and then you boil eggs and stick it in there, and it's, they're so delicious. It's like marble tea eggs that you get, you know, at like dim sum restaurants or something. Um, another is I love uh, heating leftover tea up again with as much milk as tea and making like a chai style, like sweet, yeah, not like, it's not about the tea, it's about like a clean tea, sweet situation. Um, maple syrup. And you can also put in that scenario like a few whole spices in if you wanted. Like if you're just there's that much leftover tea, put it in a pot, put in a cup of milk or cream or half and half or a combination, and then like maybe a piece of cinnamon and and then maple syrup and heat it all up and it's really hot. Then you have like this this spiced wonderful star anise. Yeah. yeah. Do you have an idea? No. <laughs> Not a big tea. Also, you could use it. It's really, really wonderful as a, um, if you add a little bit of salt and sugar, tea makes a really great brine for chicken or fish that you're going to either grill or smoke. It just, get, it, 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 it likes, it moisturizes, tenderizes things a little bit. If you just added enough sugar and salt to it to make it sort of like almost like pickle brine, but with tea, and then use that for a 24 hour brine, it would be so good. Yeah, and if you happen to make your tea with loose tea instead of tea bag, loose tea is also something you don't want to throw away. And one, one thing that uh, is done in China and probably elsewhere is the, the leaves, the, the tea leaves are spread out and dried and then you throw them on the barbecue and, and to, as uh, smoke, to add smoke to the, uh, the, the fire source when you're cooking something, especially chicken or duck or something. In fact, tea smoked duck is a, is a classic Chinese dish. On the or yeah, yeah, right on the yeah, yeah on the charcoal or on the loose it. Yeah, or if you have a gas grill, then you have a little box that you put it in, and it'll eventually catch on fire if it's dry enough. Yes, yeah. to the person with their hand up in the back. I have a recipe in my book by Lindsay Jean Hard um, that uses coffee grounds in a pie, and it's really delicious. Uh, but it's just, it's her recipe. Um, you can use them to infuse cream in addition. You, I mean, they're great for infusing things with coffee flavor. Uh, I tend to compost mine. That's what I do. Yeah, you actually have a, a, at least a, a few things, I think of like pistachio shells, where you're reusing something not by eating it, but by using it yeah. in the garden. Or and, and actually, coffee grounds, you can not even compost them. You can actually plow them into into the ground if you uh, if you have a garden. Um, and depending, I don't I don't know enough to know what plants it'll be good for, but it is good for some kinds of plants. Uh, you know, in in uh, colonial New England, uh, lobster they say was so plentiful that part of the harvest that the fishermen would bring in, the lobstermen would bring in, not not cooked and eaten, and then the shells, but the entire lobsters were plowed into the ground as fertilizer. We don't do that in the end. <laughs> yeah. So I saw online this thing about reusing banana peels. Mm -hmm. Is there something you could do with those? So I have a really delicious banana peel recipe in this book, which I swear by. And I like you can write me if it's bad, but it's it's really not. It's a it's a um and it's super common. Cooking banana peels is not like a made up thing by me. It's a all throughout South Asia. And I'm sure lots of other places. It's just an ingredient, plantain peels or banana peels. And you just soak them in water with some turmeric in it or some um, acid in it to keep them from oxidizing too fast. And then you chop them up and literally use them as the thing in the curry. It's a dry, it's like a dry curry, meaning that there's no coconut milk or another um, 
moist fur like that, but it's like super, they get tender really fast. It's, if you've ever had like, it's just like a meat. Like it, it works like any sort of main ingredient would. Um, when I told, and then you can also, there, there's also a like more of a banana peel jammy recipe that I haven't done, but the curry recipe is just delicious and it's great. Um, I'll tell you one more and then I'll answer your next question. But somebody told me at my last book event that you can also soak them in water and then use that water to water your plants. And that these all, I don't forget what's in them, but potassium or whatever it is, which ends up in your plant watering water and it's really good. Oh, so it's not only for your tea leaves and your cooking, it's for your meals also. Oh. That's your fresh or for the only yeah. use of that? Yeah, it doesn't matter, you're cooking them. Okay. Yeah. And, and I know you, you write about um, overripe bananas, really brown, mushy bananas. I, I was walking through a market in Mexico City with, uh, with a chef there and he saw these, uh, and you had bananas at every stage and every size and different color skins and everything. And, and he bought a bunch of these ones that, you know, would definitely be in the trash can here that were brown, dark brown and mushy and all. And he said, these, these are so good. And he said, I'm going to make uh, some desserts with these. And, you know, it's, it's almost, they're, they're ready already. I don't have to do anything to them. And they're, the sweetness is concentrated. And, and, uh, and as you know, too, in Southeast Asia, that not only bananas and banana peels, but they eat banana flowers, banana leaves. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a plant that really gives a lot that we don't uh, ordinarily have access to or know what to do with. There was a yes in the back. Mayonnaise chicken salad? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you have something to add? No, I was going to say um, first of all, it, it'll keep for um, probably yeah. almost yeah. a week. Yeah. I don't know. Absolute best A plus fried rice ingredient that has ever existed. 
And you can, like a very simple way to do it is, so you know how there's like the, the solids in the chili oil and the liquid? You can literally like turn on a pan, pour in the liquid oil, put in your old rice or a little bit of, you know, chopped scallion, garlic, whatever you have. But if you just have rice, it's fine. Put that in, do all the frying, and then add the solids. You're done. Put an egg on that. You're great. Um, another thing, so that's one thing is you just use it for fried rice. That whole thing. You can also make a, if you want to do it like a sauce in there, like if you don't want to make fried rice today, but you're looking at it, you have that jar that you had. Put in, a, if you have time to chop a clove of garlic, do. If not, just smash one and stick it in there because it'll get garlicky. Put in some fish sauce, put in some uh, lime juice, lemon juice, whatever. Put in some water, a little bit of sugar, and then like shake it all up, and you have a like a full sauce that could be that could you could marinate, you know, tofu in it or chicken in it or whatever in it. But you have like a or it could be a noodle sauce. But then you have a whole together thing. Yeah, I, I was going to say uh, first of all, it'll last forever in, in the refrigerator. I mean, uh, you use a little bit at a time. I would splash it into I do stir fries sometimes, uh, in which I use like um, a little bit of let's say sesame oil, but not too much because it's an overpowering flavor. And a little bit of that, along with soy or whatever else I was, depending on what I was using, it's a, it's a great thing to have. I mean, and you could even, it doesn't have to be anything vaguely Asian either. Uh, you, could, you could put it into really anything that, uh, any kind of a, a spaghetti sauce or something, and it would be very good. Wait, there's, uh, yes, in the back. That, that again, it's, it's great for for uh, vinaigrettes, and that's it, it's uh, depending if it's packed in oil or water. Though they're two different kinds. Mm -hmm. it, well, the, 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 the marinade one, so it's like yeah. So it's oil. fee and oil, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, you uh, you get a, almost don't have to do anything. Squeeze a little lemon or put a little vinegar in there and slosh it on your salad. That's instant salad dressing. Yeah. Also, another good sort of marinating thing, especially because yeah. there's a lot of it. So like if you had, if you ever grilled chicken breasts or, or fry, or like if there's, if you have any protein at all, including, you know, tofu or something that you fry or grill, I would taste it before, because I often feel like those things are, they're, like a, they're good, but a little bit unbalanced. Like you could taste it and you're like, it's okay, but not great. And then change it so that it tastes great. So like usually those, I feel like you need um, a little bit more fat and a little bit more salt. And sometimes a little bit of sweetness. But then once it tastes really delicious, then it's a perfect marinade or brine. Um, and because there's, like, once it tastes good, which you can tinker your way to uh, just by tasting it, they tend to be acidic and weirdly under salted. I don't know. They're, they're very acidic. Um, then you can, then it really will imbue whatever flavor is in there, plus a little bit of that, like, nice artichokiness, or whatever, to, like, chicken breast, you just, you know, stick them in, or steak, or, you know, tofu, or whatever. You had a question? So I have, I have a suggestion for um, coffee grounds. I made a swiss bread with coffee grounds, huh? and... Um, can everybody hear? Yeah. My, my coffee grounds, um, I made a coffee ground foot scrub with um, coconut oil, which was really nice. Um, but, but my in the refrigerator now, I have falafel. Okay. I love leftover falafel. I have two falafel recipes in the book. Um, one of them is, have you ever had larb, which is like the Thai, it's a Thai salad that's a chopped up yeah, ground, yeah, ground. Pork or something, yeah. Right. Um, with tons and tons of herbs and tons and tons of um, shallots. It's like, a, it's like there's as much of everything else as there is the, the ground um, meat. And I have made really delicious leftover falafel lard. There's a oh, recipe really? in the book. Yeah, it's so good. It's like as much chopped herb and sliced shallot and all that stuff. Um, and it's great. You can also smash it. Like the thing with leftover fried things is that there's all this like cold inside that you can't 
but get to. So I like to smash leftover fried things and heat them that way. See, if you smash it and heat it in a hot pan, it can then, then it gets really delicious. So you have to heat in the pan, put in some fat, smash it in there, and then all of the inside that, that hasn't had access to like getting crisp gets re-crisped, newly crisped, mega crisp. Else? Yes, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, onion peels. Oh, sorry. Did you want to go first? No, no, that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I never throw them away. They're always in my garden. The tea goes on my lilac bushes at the bottom. Can people hear? The tea I use. Do you want to use the microphone? I'm always considered so loud. <laughs> <laughs> I always use tea leaves in my garden at uh, the base of lilac bushes. It's very important for that. Egg shells are never thrown out. They're particularly important under your tomato plants. They give it tremendous potassium. So they're never thrown out. I do have a compost pile. Had it for years. And it's separated. This pile, this pile was active. This pile is now being built up. Everything goes into those compost piles. It's the only compost I use. Um, with the coffee grinds, they go right in the garden. I just throw them. I go off my deck and I just dump the, the filter with the coffee grinds in. It aerates the soil. It's very important that we have air in the soil because weeds can rot if um, they don't get air. They, they need the oxygen and coffee grinds are a big help. With the leftover bread that you were talking about, I come from an Italian heritage, and they go in the frying pan with olive oil and lots of herbs, and it's a snack. And uh, it becomes French toast the next day and the day after that. Uh, we also make it on bread crumbs with it, uh, too. Well, there were so many other things that you were talking about that I was doing already. <laughs> um, I, I come from an agrarian family, and background, so my father taught me so much of this stuff. But um, I really appreciate it. I love your sense of humor for both of you, and it adds a lot to your presentation, so I thank you so much for all of that. Thank you. I, there's a, I know there's another question here, but I yeah. want to acknowledge one thing. I, I'm so glad that you said that you knew a lot of this already, because I do think it's really important to, to like say and be clear that I don't, this is, I'm no, no, I don't think I made any of this up, and it's not proprietary, and it's like this is sort of the wisdom of humanity. This is like we, we know this, and if we forget parts of it, we're just passing it back along to each other. So I'm glad that you said that. Yes? Two things about peels. Uh, the dried onion peel that you normally dispose of, I know it can be used to dye things, but does it have any other purpose? Uh, culinary purpose of some sort. I use I use onion peels instead of onion in anything that I'm making that's slow cooking. So I only use the onion itself if I'm going to be eating the onion. If I'm making beans or braised, like braised pork shoulder or braised or brisket or anything like that that calls for onion where it's just going to be cooked, I use onion peel for stock because peels have a ton of flavor still. So it's like if you're not going to eat the onion, you can totally just... Yes, and not, not the skin, though. Yeah, the skin. You eat the skin. Yeah. No, you don't eat it. You just no, use okay. it in yeah, the braids. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. It gives the flavor. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you just take it out afterwards because yeah. it doesn't dissolve away. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You have to like. There's a lot of plucking now. Yeah, but <laughs> the same thing for potatoes. If you're boiling whole potatoes and you're going to make mashed potatoes or something, you're going to peel the skin away for the most part. But it's the very edge of the skin, not with any real potato meat on it. Is there anything you can do with that that's of practical value? I do a pre-boil. So if, I, if I'm peeling them before cooking them, which I think often, potatoes, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. This is about potato peels. Um, I peel, if I peel potatoes before cooking them, which I sometimes do, those are really delicious roasted, mixed with hot, you know, with olive oil and then roasted in a hot oven. They can also be deep fried, but just literally olive oil, salt in a 400 degree oven, and then you take them out and they're like crispy potato skins. And then I like to do um, like grated cheese and scallion 
on top of them. But, but that's when they have some of the potato actually in them. I'm talking about if you boil the whole potato with the skin on, yeah. and then you gently peel away the potato skin, oh. which is just a very fine outer yeah. portion of it. Is there anything you can do with that? Culinary? Yeah. Should be able to deep fry, dry it and deep fry it, don't you think? I mean, sure, if you have a deep fryer going, but I would, that seems like a good compostable. Yeah. You've done a lot there. Well, we, we compost things all the yeah. time. But yeah. I, at that point, I would feel like it's probably done its work. The skin has done its work. But it, you could definitely deep fry it if you wanted to. And you know you want to be careful. I'm sure everyone knows that you don't want to eat green skin or sprouts on a potato. I literally say in my book, that I've eaten greens, <laughs> done all of it, and survived. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I know. There's some. I can't tell you to do it. I just. Yeah. So actually, this is actually a substitution question. Um, I think we have a recipe that calls for certain salt and you know, the names of people that it tastes like soap for. What could you substitute? Um, mint and basil. You like mint and basil? Yeah, either of those, or a combination. Coriander seed. It works fantastic. Doesn't that do well? Coriander yes, is cilantro. Same flavor, yeah. yeah. But you don't have to say that it's a different taste. It's a oh, different okay. taste than yeah. the leaf. But I think if you're if it's a if it's cilantro, if it calls for cilantro, I would do like mint and basil. Yeah, I mean cilantro is is such a unique flavor, which and I know a lot of people that's genetic that it, you can't stand the taste of it. My wife hates it. I love it, but do you have it? Yeah, I have a lot of friends that love it. Yeah, but, but it's, I mean, you can substitute other herbs, certainly, but it won't taste the same because sure. it's such a unique yeah. uh, well, flavor. Well, mint and basil yeah. and mint and holy basil, both, yeah. that, yeah. that has the same, like, yeah. aromatic, there's yeah. something, it's not the same, but it's as good. Yeah. We have time for one more question, and then we'd like Tamar to sign some books. Yes. Um, this is a different sort of question, but I love all of these suggestions and can easily imagine like having a fridge and a freezer full of like odd demented things that I'm saving to do other things with. Do you have strategies for how you keep track of what you have that you need? And like see all the times that you're planning to yeah. use to make sure that you don't forget to save them. I think we should both answer this, but uh, yeah. Yes, one thing that I do is I do label what things, I, I write a label saying what things are um, for, for, for cooked food, which I didn't, I didn't used to do, but I now do, and I, and I think it helps. Um, another is it's really helpful to like, not have everything all the time, because if you have everything in your kitchen all the time, it's really a lot harder to remember that thing that you had before. Like if you have a shopping list, it's like I always need to have, you know, like a whatever, a quart of cream, or then you always have the cream, and then you never notice that your empty yogurt jar could work just as well as the cream. So I think like letting yourself run low and labeling what you have are two really good ones. And then um, and like thinking about what you could do with your whatever it is before you put it away without having to like plan it. I don't mean like plan and making a chart, but like kind of imagining what, like, okay, I'm putting this away because I will need it for beans and kind of getting a mental sense of like, okay, if it's a vegetable peel or an herb stem, that'll be in the like to make beans or stock category. If it's a cooked potato, that'll be in the like slice up and fry tomorrow category. There's also the fact that I really think it's important to like try to do it soon and don't make a different plan. Right, like if you have cooked boiled potatoes, tomorrow you're having fried potatoes, sliced fried potatoes. You're not doing, or, or, or something else that you could do with what you have. Um, and it'll be delicious, but just don't make a different, I think that's why I also have never made like those week meal plan things, because they don't account for, like if you do Taco Tuesday, and Wednesday is like uh, salad mislaws, like what about all the taco stuff? So I just think you need to like, you know, go, okay, what am I going to do with the taco stuff on Wednesday? And um, there's, you know, so many things to do. Is that helpful? Yeah. You want to take it? 
Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I rarely um, have, we rarely have a lot of stuff in the refrigerator that's uh, leftover that's remains of other meals. But at least once or twice a week, I make uh, what my wife um, turns up her nose at and says, oh, hash again. So I, I make hash out of like of anything. So if I have, you know, a, a little, a, a couple little uh, pieces of chicken left over, and I have a half an apple, and I have some, I don't know, white beans, and I have some wilted scallions, and I have some, I don't know, I go on and on, whatever there is. The bad thing about that is sometimes it doesn't taste very good. <laughs> <laughs> but the even worse thing is when it's like the best thing I've had in months, <laughs> and I know I can never repeat it. <laughs> That's the saddest culinary truth in it my is, house, yeah. that I can never, we, we talk about it all the time, but we'll be eating something, and we'll be like, oh my god, this is so good. Too bad we can never eat <laughs> it again. <laughs> Tomorrow, Coleman. Thank you. Yo, thank you very much.